In this video, we're going to take a look at some questions from practice exam 3.1 in the spring 2023 semester related to galvanic cells, electrolysis, and the thermodynamics and chemical equilibrium that underpins electrochemistry. In question six, we're asked about the weakest oxidizing agent in the list here, given the standard reduction potentials that are in the problem. And so I think the first thing we should do here is remind ourselves what we mean by standard reduction potential. So standard reduction potential is the voltage we would observe if we hooked up a galvanic cell involving one half cell with the components in the half reaction shown, for example, zinc two plus and zinc, and the other half cell being the standard hydrogen electrode. And where we observe a negative potential, the potential of the cathode half cell is, is actually lower than the potential of the standard hydrogen electrode, meaning electrons will flow spontaneously into the standard hydrogen electrode and reduction will occur there and oxidation will occur in our half cell of interest. So in these half reactions, which are the standard reduction half reactions, we see that the thing undergoing reduction is the thing that quote unquote reacts with the electrons, the things that adds electrons and becomes reduced itself. So for example, here, zinc two plus is undergoing reduction. This makes zinc an oxidizing agent because after all, those two electrons had to come from somewhere, right? So zinc two plus in this process is acting as an oxidizing agent, for example, oxidizing H2 in the standard hydrogen electrode and kind of the standard setup for standard reduction potentials. So the oxidizing agents in these half reactions are the reactant species, zinc 2 plus, Fe 2 plus, Na plus, and Cr 3 plus. The neutral metal products are not oxidizing agents at all. In fact, we would think about them as reducing agents given these reduction potentials because, of course, these potentials tell us something about the potential of the reverse process, oxidation of, for example, zinc metal to go to zinc 2 plus and 2 electrons. So the weakest oxidizing agent. What do we mean by this? Well, the weakest oxidizing agent is the metal cation that is most difficult to reduce. And this corresponds to the least positive or most negative reduction potential. The higher the reduction potential, the more spontaneous, quote unquote, reduction is of that metal cation, the more favorable it is thermodynamically speaking. And so if we're looking for the least favorable reduction, the weakest oxidizing agent, that corresponds to the least positive or most negative reduction potential. And here, that is the sodium cation with a whoppingly negative reduction potential of negative 2.71 volts. So Na plus here is the weakest oxidizing agent, and this should make intuitive sense. The Na plus cation is very, very stable as a cation. It is not inclined at all to obtain an additional electron and form sodium metal, essentially unless it's forced to by some very, very strong reducing agent. Here at question seven, we're asked for the standard potential of an electrolytic cell using the redox couples or redox pairs vanadium-3 and vanadium-2 and titanium-2 and titanium solid or titanium metal and we're given the standard reduction potentials for vanadium-3 and titanium-2 going to the corresponding products and uh, the potentials as well. So we're looking for the voltage of an electrolytic cell in which we're driving a non-spontaneous redox reaction. So something to keep in mind here is that this standard potential should be negative. There should be a voltage less than zero volts since we need to supply that voltage from an external power source like a battery or a generator or something along those lines to get this reaction to go in an electrolytic cell. That's essentially the definition of an electrolytic cell that we're applying here. Okay, so first let's draw a picture of what the setup is going to look like. Like a galvanic cell, an electrolytic cell is going to use two half cells with the reactants and products in each half cell. So in one half cell, for example, we'll have titanium metal and titanium 2 plus, and under standard conditions, the titanium 2 plus would have a molarity of one mole per liter. And then in the other half cell, we'll have vanadium 3 plus and vanadium 2 plus in aqueous solution at a concentration of one mole per liter. And we're gonna need some kind of inert electrode to deliver electrons, something like a platinum electrode that I've just indicated here. For the purposes of this problem though, we can essentially ignore that since that platinum Platinum electrode won't affect the thermodynamics, which is really what dictates the potential of the cell. 
Now, to actually drive a non-spontaneous redox process, we can't just hook up the two half cells with a wire, right? That would lead to spontaneous electron flow and the, and the spontaneous redox reaction. We have to actually connect to a power source like a battery to force electrons in the non-spontaneous direction. And the question is, what is the non-spontaneous direction? Well, what we can do now is return to the standard reduction potentials and realize that the non-spontaneous direction is going to correspond to a negative overall potential. So we're going to need to flip one of these reduction reactions to an oxidation, but do so such that the overall potential, the potential of the oxidation plus the potential of the reduction, is negative. And the way to do that is to flip the titanium reduction to an oxidation. And what we need to do is use the battery to force electrons out of the titanium half cell and force them into the vanadium-3, vanadium-2 half cell, like this. So the non-spontaneous redox reaction here is going to involve titanium being oxidized to titanium-2 and vanadium-3 being reduced to vanadium-2. And here I've, I've added coefficients of 2. Um, just to ensure that the number of electrons lost on the oxidation side is balanced by the number of electrons gained on the reduction side. And also to make the point that this scaling has no effect on the cell potentials that we use to think about the potential of the electrolytic cell. There's no need to scale the voltage when you scale a half reaction like this. Just use the standard potential as given, possibly flipping the sign where you flip a reduction to an oxidation, as we did here in the case of titanium. So now that we've laid out this drawing, we can draw some conclusions about the potentials involved here. We're forcing electrons from left to right, and to do that, the battery needs to sort of overcome or surmount this voltage difference between 163, 0.163 volts and 0.255 volts. And that difference is the standard potential of the electrolytic cell, the potential of the cathode, minus the potential of the anode. And here the minus sign comes from the fact that we flipped the reduction of titanium 2 to titanium. You could also write this as the reduction potential of the half reaction occurring in the cathode plus the oxidation potential of the half reaction occurring in the anode. Here, because we're dealing with reduction potentials, we do E cathode minus E anode, although the two ways of thinking about this are exactly equivalent. Okay, how does this shake out? Well, we've got negative 0.163 volts on the titanium side. We've got negative 0.255 volts on the vanadium side. And notice, this is the cathode. This is where reduction is occurring. And this is the anode. This is where oxidation is occurring. So applying this idea, we've got negative 0.255 volts minus negative 0.163 volts, and that comes out to negative 0.92 volts, the standard potential of this electrolytic cell. And it's negative exactly as we would have expect based on the fact that we're driving a non-spontaneous redox reaction inside this cell. In question eight, we're asked something about the one of the components inside a galvanic cell under non-standard conditions. Notice we're given the cell potential for a galvanic cell that is not necessarily under standard conditions. No little circle there and we'll see that the conditions are very non-standard. So the given cell potential is 1.8 volts. We're going to use that here shortly. And we know the cell is made from an H plus H2 half cell. That is like the standard hydrogen electrode but not necessarily under standard conditions. Same half reactions are involved, as well as a gold-3 gold metal half cell at 298 Kelvin. We may need to use that temperature. And we know that the concentration of gold-3, AU3+, is 0.92 molar. And in the other half cell, the partial pressure of H2 is 1.3 atmospheres. So this concentration and this partial pressure are very far from standard conditions. So this is a non-standard galvanic cell. And what we want to know is, what is the pH of the anode solution? As we'll see shortly, the anode is the H plus H2 half cell. This is where oxidation is occurring. What essentially we want to know is, when the cell potential is 1.8 volts, what is the corresponding concentration of H plus given all this other information? What this suggests is we're going to need to use the Nernst equation, which helps us understand the relationship between the reaction quotient for the spontaneous redox reaction occurring in a galvanic cell and the observed cell potential under non-standard conditions.
In order to proceed with the Nernst equation, though, we need to know what the standard cell potential is first. And this is where the half reaction here below comes into play. This is the standard reduction potential of gold 3. Here's the standard reduction half reaction of gold 3. And keep in mind that the standard reduction of H plus, well, by convention, that has a potential of 0.0, .0 volts. So we can conclude from this immediately that the standard cell potential for the galvanic cell described is just positive 1.52 volts. This corresponds to the reduction potential of gold 3. So this is our standard potential, and we can see that the observed cell potential is a good distance away from the standard potential here. So next, let's draw a picture and kind of take stock of, of what we know in this galvanic cell. We know that the observed potential is 1.8 volts. And on the left, we have 1.3 atmospheres of H2 gas in that half cell. We have some molarity of H+. We don't know that, and that is exactly what we're trying to find, and then ultimately the pH. In the other half cell, we've got gold metal, some amount of gold metal, doesn't matter, right, because it's a solid, and we have aqueous gold 3 plus to the tune of 0.92 moles per liter. Now, based on this logic we um, laid out about the standard cell potential and the half reactions occurring, we know that gold 3 is being reduced to gold metal spontaneously in this galvanic cell, and that's worth pausing and thinking through if you're not sure about that. This tells us that the gold is uh, half cell is that cathode half cell, the cathode side, while the H2H plus half cell is the anode side. Oxidation is occurring in that H2H plus half cell, and reduction is occurring in the AU3 plus AU half cell, and electrons then are flowing from left to right in this drawing. Okay, so we've laid out everything we know in a picture, we know the standard cell potential, and now it's time to engage the Nernst equation. The Nernst equation essentially says, in one form, that the difference between the non-standard and standard cell potential, in our case 1.8 volts minus 1.52 volts, is equal to negative RT divided by N times Faraday's constant times the natural log of Q. So that difference between the, the non-standard and standard cell potential is 0.28 volts. The value of N is 6, and I sort of glossed over this, but if we back up to the half reactions in the overall balanced equation for the spontaneous reaction occurring in this galvanic cell, we see that there are 6 electrons lost in the oxidation and 6 electrons gained in the reduction, and this ensures balance overall. Again, this is worth pausing and verifying on your own to convince yourself that it's true. It's also helpful, I think, to add up the two half reactions and write the overall balanced chemical equation for the redox reaction occurring here, just for a little bit of extra practice. Okay, so the value of N is 6, F is a constant, R, the ideal gas constant, is a constant, and the temperature, which we're going to need to use, is 298 Kelvin. The only thing we need to unpack a little bit more here is the value of Q, but the given conditions in the galvanic cell tell us about the nature of Q, right? First of all, Q is the products raised to their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the reactants raised to their respective stoichiometric coefficients. H plus is a product, and there are six H pluses in the balanced equation. Gold solid is a product that we can completely ignore. Gold 3 is a reactant, and H2 is a reactant. And so what we end up with for Q is H plus to the sixth power in the numerator, the partial pressure of H2 to the third power in the denominator, and the concentration of gold 3 to the second power in the denominator as well. This actually leaves H plus to the sixth power as the only unknown, right, if we plug back into the equation above. And so we can solve for H plus, and I'm going to spare us all the math of doing this, but again, I encourage you to pause, plug this expression in here, and solve for the value of H plus molarity. What we end up with is 2.04 times 10 to the negative 5 moles per liter, and the corresponding pH, just found by taking the negative base 10 logarithm of this, is 4.69. And indeed, 4.69 is an answer choice. So slightly acidic pH to achieve this potential of 1.8 volts. Now something you can practice on your own with this problem that may be helpful is to ask yourself what would happen if the pH changed. What would happen if the pH went down? Would the voltage decrease, become less positive, or increase, become more positive? What if the voltage 
went up. You can apply the Nernst equation and think through the Nernst equation conceptually to work through that. In question nine, we're given a series of statements on the left-hand side and asked whether these apply to galvanic cells, electrolytic cells, both types of cells, or neither type of cell. So I think it helps here to start to remind ourselves what are the characteristics of a galvanic cell, what are the characteristics of electrolytic cell, and just to compare and contrast them a little bit. So in a galvanic cell, we're using a spontaneous redox reaction occurring between the anode and cathode to power something, right, to push electrons through an electrical load, for example, lighting up a light bulb, as I've shown in the figure. So electrons flow from the anode to the cathode spontaneously because there's chemical energy actually built into the anode and cathode. There's a spontaneous redox reaction that can only take place when electrons flow. And this leads to, for example, the powering of an electrical load connected between the two half cells. In an electrolytic cell, we've got, on some level, the opposite situation. We've got a redox reaction that is non-spontaneous now, um, that can only occur when electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, but in a thermodynamic sense, electrons do not want, quote unquote, to flow from the anode to the cathode. If we just hooked up the ends of the two half cells of an electrolytic cell to each other, electrons would flow in the opposite direction spontaneously. To drive electrons from the left half cell to the right half cell, we need to include some power source. And here I've just shown it as a battery. This will sort of push or pull electro electrons from the left-hand electrode to the right-hand electrode. But because electrons are still leaving this left electrode and still entering this right electrode, oxidation is still occurring over here. It's still the anode, and reduction is still occurring over here. It is still the cathode. Okay, so the basic difference here is we got a non-spontaneous redox reaction that requires an external power source to pull or push electro electrons from the anode to the cathode. In the galvanic case, we can just hook up the two ends to each other and electrons will flow spontaneously or flow through an electrical load spontaneously because the, spon the redox reaction that's occurring in here is spontaneous. Okay, cell potential greater than zero. Well, that applies when the redox reaction occurring in the cell is spontaneous. So that applies only to the galvanic cell case. K less than 1 implies that the redox reaction occurring in the cell is thermodynamically disfavored or favors the reactants, right? To, if we want to push that reaction toward products, we need to provide an external energy source, and that only occurs in an electrolytic cell. Delta G less than 0 indicates a spontaneous redox reaction occurring in the cell, and we know that that only applies for galvanic cells. Notice that in both types of cell, electrochemical cell, we have electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode and not from the cathode to the anode, which is the next statement. So this statement here applies to both types of cells. And for similar reasons, oxidation occurs at the anode and reduction at the cathode. And this applies to both types of electrochemical cells. Reduction never occurs at the anode, essentially by definition. This problem, we're told that we have an 11.1 .1 amp current, a current at this amperage, running through molten rhodium-3 nitrate, and we're producing rhodium solid or rhodium metal, and we'd like to produce 7.96 grams of that stuff, and want to know how long do I need to run this current in order to achieve that mass of rhodium produced. So the fact that we want to know a time and there's a mass involved and a reaction and a number of electrons in the form of a charge per time involved suggests that this is a stoichiometry problem. And it's a stoichiometry problem involving electrolysis. We are pushing current into that thing to force the reduction of rhodium-3 to rhodium metal. So it's an electrolysis going on. And I think a good place to start with electrolysis is to take it back to basics and write the half reaction for the reduction or oxidation that we're forcing in this system. And here, that's the reduction of rhodium-3 plus to rhodium metal. And notice, to ensure that charge is balanced here, three electrons are added to the rhodium-3 to produce neutral rhodium solid. And we're going to use those stoichiometric coefficients, three electrons and one rhodium solid, here in a second. Now, as I like to do in stoichiometry problems, it's a good idea to kind of chart your course before you start plugging in numbers and drawing railroad tracks and getting on the dimensional analysis train, so to speak. And so, what we know 
on the left here is the mass of rhodium. And what we want to know is the time required to produce this mass of rhodium. But to find that out, we ultimately have to go through the moles of rhodium and the moles of electrons and the charge associated with that number of moles of electrons. We can find the total quantity of charge that corresponds to this mass of rhodium produced by following this kind of stoichiometric path. You know, as in all stoichiometry problems, we need to go through mole world to figure this out. And then to go from charge to time, we're going to apply ideas about electrical current that sort of transcend chemistry on some level, but are too intuitive to understand given that one amp is a coulomb per second. It's a unit of charge per time. Okay, before we start plugging in numbers, let's figure out how we're going to do each conversion here. So mass of rhodium to moles of rhodium just corresponds to dividing by the molar mass of rhodium, and this I just pulled straight off the periodic table. Moles rhodium to moles of electrons is where we're going to use these stoichiometric coefficients in the half reaction that we wrote above. That's why it's useful to have that half reaction at this point. Three moles of electrons are needed to produce one mole of rhodium metal from rhodium-3. So this will tell us the moles of electrons. To go from moles of electrons to charge, well, the charge in a mole of electrons is a constant, right? At the end of the day, it's related to the elementary charge of the electron itself. That's Faraday's constant, 96485 coulombs per mole of electrons. And then to go from the charge to the time, we're going to divide by the current, right? Or multiply by in one second, we deliver 11.1 .1 coulombs of charge. OK, so we've charted our path. We've determined each conversion. Now we can start with the numbers, 7.96 grams. Dividing by the molar mass, we get 0.0774 moles of rhodium. Multiply that by 3, we get 0.232 moles of electrons. Multiply by Faraday's constant, and we get 2.23 times 10 to the fourth power coulombs of charge. And then dividing by the amperage, we get the time in seconds, which is about 2,000 seconds. And if you convert that to minutes by dividing by 60, you end up with about 33.6 minutes. So electrolysis and stoichiometry allowing us to go from a target mass of a product that we want to make and the amperage we're delivering to the time required to produce that product. In question 11, we know the value of delta G, this should say delta G, for a given redox reaction. It's negative 52.1 kilojoules. We also know that the standard cell potential is 0.135 volts. And what we want to know is how many electrons are lost in the anode half reaction during the spontaneous reaction. So first of all, we know the reaction is spontaneous even without the problem telling us that because the free energy change is negative and the cell potential is positive. And this how many electrons are lost in the anode half reaction, well, keep in mind that is equivalent to the number of electrons gained in the cathode's reduction half reaction, and it's just equal to the number of electrons transferred in the overall balanced redox reaction. So what we're looking for here is that value of n that shows up in the Nernst equation and in the relationship between free energy change and cell potential under standard conditions as we're applying here. To remind ourselves about that relationship, Keep in mind what a volt is. A volt is a unit of energy per charge. Energy per charge. And, and so a joule, actually, divided by a coulomb corresponds to a volt. This suggests the relationship between delta G and the cell potential. Delta G is equal to the cell potential times the amount of charge moved in a mole of reaction events. If we're thinking about this in something like joules per mole, the cell potential times the number of coulombs, if you like, the charge moved, is equal to um, delta G. And the charge moved is negative F, the charge in a mole of electrons, signed, right, because the sign matters now, times the number of uh, electrons transferred per reaction event, which corresponds to this how many electrons are lost value that we're trying to find. So just to solidify the units, say your free energy change is in joule per mole, joules per mole of reaction events. Well, a volt is a joule per coulomb, and F is a coulombs per mole of electrons. And so to make the units work out here, what we're looking for is N, and the corresponding units of N are the moles of electrons transferred per mole of reaction events. And if we just kind of scratch out the moles here briefly, you'll see this is the number of electrons transferred in a single reaction occurrence. 
Okay, so how do we find this, particularly given that we don't have any half reactions? How do we find this? Well, we actually do have enough information in the problem to isolate n as the only unknown variable. We know this, f is a constant, we know that, and so n remains the only unknown. We can solve for n. It's negative delta g divided by f times the cell potential. And if we plug in those numbers and calculate out all the business, notice that I converted the given kilojoules per mole into joules, and I just ditched the negative sign because this negative sign cancels with that negative sign or divides out with that negative sign. We end up with four electrons transferred in the balanced chemical equation for the redox reaction, or equivalently, how many electrons are lost in the anode half reaction or gained in the reduction half reaction. I really like question 12 because it bridges the gap from electrochemistry to chemical equilibrium and draws on our appreciation for what makes a good oxidizing or reducing agent. So here we're asked for the strongest oxidizing agent given the information below. And the information given is not standard reduction potentials, but equilibrium constants, K values, for these half reactions. Hmm. So now we're forced to think about the relationship between the equilibrium constant and what makes an oxidizing agent strong, let's say. So let's talk through that before we dig into the answer here. So first thing to notice is that the reactant species, A3+, plus, X4-, minus, E2+, plus, Z6+, plus here, are undergoing reduction. That means in the direction these half reactions are written, these cations on the left are acting as oxidizing agents. So in finding the strongest oxidizing agent, we're essentially asking which of these species is reduced most favorably, is one way to put it. The easiest to reduce. In the language of reduction potential, that corresponds to the most positive reduction potential. But how does that relate to equilibrium constant? Well, you could work through all of the thermodynamic sort of math to relate K to the cell potential. Or you could think about this intuitively. The more positive the reduction potential, the more favorable the reduction reaction, the greater its K value, right? So the strongest oxidizing agent here corresponds to the greatest equilibrium constant, the most product favored, if you like, equilibrium constant. And here, far and away, that's associated with the Z six plus cation whose K value is uh, two orders of magnitude higher than the closest, uh, the second closest, which is X four plus. So uh, again, just to summarize, because the cell potential is proportional to negative delta G and negative delta G is proportional to the natural log of K, this is that thermodynamics math that I was alluding to earlier, the cell potential is directly po uh, proportional to the natural log of K. And, and actually, this applies for, for any potential, cell or half cell. So reduction potentials, the idea still applies. The reduction potential is proportional to the natural log of K for the reduction half reaction. So the same logic we would use for the cell potentials, for the reduction potentials rather, we're going to use for the K values. Z6 plus has the most positive or the highest K value. K's always got to be positive, so highest K value. And it is absolutely the best oxidizing agent here. It is reduced most favorably, right? So one way to think about it is Z6 plus is very good at pulling electrons away from whatever it's reacting with. It's a very good oxidizing agent in that respect.